Hi everyone, thank you for coming back to this, the third and final video on the political compass. The first one was an introduction to the differences between authoritarian and libertarian, left and right, and where I have found myself on the chart over the years. The second video on this subject was about the left and why I'm in the bottom left rather than the top or the right. In this video, we're going to be talking about the center if we can find it. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Centrism is a popular stance to take nowadays. It lets us think we don't blindly pick sides, but decide things on a case-by-case -case basis. On the surface, that makes sense. We'd rather look at all the options available to us, not hastily join a team and pretend our team is right. One reason centrism is so popular is both liberals and conservatives, apparently the only two teams available to join, can both be wrong. But as you know from my last video, they aren't the only two teams or two sides. There are plenty more ideas out there. Centrists should learn about those ideas, because in practice, holding the center is impossible. Let's do what we did in the last video, which is look briefly at how these terms are commonly defined. We can start with this uh, Wikipedia article on centrism. It says centrism is a political outlook or specific position that involves acceptance or support of a balance of a degree of social equality and a degree of social hierarchy while opposing political changes, which would result in a significant shift of society strongly to either the left or the right. The same entry also gives a bunch of different examples of what centrism means in different countries, and that's important to bear in mind that it means different things in different places, because it tends to take on connotations when used in public discourse. The political compass here can, of course, like we say, uh, be useful in looking at someone's theoretical views. But what does it mean to be a centrist? Does it mean to find oneself right here in the center or in a small area that could be considered the center? What, what does that even really mean? Outside a political context, nothing. I've said before, the status quo is around here, pretty far to the right because of the vast inequalities in society, and pretty high up the authoritarian scale because, of course, there is a small ruling class that claims a monopoly on the use of force, on the land, on making and applying laws, on punishments. Some people we m think we might need to use even more force. Maybe to make the rich richer, maybe to enact their fantasies of ethnic cleansing, maybe because they think it'll bring on the end of the world. It varies. Other people say we should use less force, maybe punish fewer things and give lighter punishments. So does that mean a centrist should be in the middle of that? Why? Or why not? Let's look at some examples to get what it means or what people want us to think it means. There's this article in the Toronto Sun, Centrism is Not Dead. It's interesting, you can see front and center, it starts with a photo of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. That's a pretty good example of what in present day political culture in the US and Britain think of as centrism. And it's pretty revealing. Both of those two politicians were elected promising a third way, a middle-of-the-road deal between the apparently undesirable positions of left and right. And so one can, of course, argue that their policies were indeed middle-of-the-road, although they kind of, they kind of defined middle-of-the-road by their existence. But what is that road? Who says that's the right road to be on? And who says the middle of it is the place to be? Whatever supposedly liberal policies Clinton and Blair ever implemented, 
they certainly helped the rich get richer and kicked poor people off welfare and put more police on the streets and went to war on the other side of the world. Those are right-wing positions, authoritarian positions. And I think they show that whatever good they claim to do, the system doesn't really allow a president or prime minister to have principles. And, and so anyone who supports them has to forfeit their principles or do some kind of mental gymnastics to justify them. I'm opposed to war on principle, but Clinton apparently had to bomb Belgrade and had to send missiles into the Al-Shifa pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. After all, it looked like it was owned by Al-Qaeda. In the end, people in government work for the people with political influence, who are usually the rich. If you don't at least oppose that, that system on principle, then you're not really for freedom or justice or equality in principle. And I'm, I'm not judging, I'm not saying my values are the right values, but that's what I care about. And if you don't, then what do you care about? Do you care more about systems and parties than you do about actual things like justice and freedom? What do you care about, though? There's a good chance some of your values could be charted somewhere on the political compass. There's this article in The Guardian, which doesn't really define centrism, but does say that the results of, of their opinion poll showed that voters appear to like the idea of the center as against either the left or right. As you'd expect, the center was considered more pragmatic, moderate, and to an extent competent. But what we found interesting is that it didn't do noticeably worse than the left for principled, and actually did better than both for understand the concerns of ordinary people being trustworthy and optimistic. I might be wrong, but I would think all that means is politicians need to seem to be those things and then paint themselves as centrists. Just don't take any unacceptably radical views and you're a centrist. I mean, what does pragmatic even mean? I think it just means being realistic as opposed to idealistic. But then what are you working toward? Reform? No ideals? What's the point of politics then? Just to keep this system going? And how would a supposedly pragmatic and optimistic politician consider people who, for instance, introduce bills into parliaments to close borders to immigrants and refugees? Do you compromise with them? Would you denounce them and refuse to work with them? Or only if it's pragmatic? I might also com comment quickly on the use of their word competent. You hear that a lot in political discourse. Competence and sometimes experience in politics, they sound like good things. They're virtues. The question is, what are their policies? If you're against their policies, you don't want them carried out competently. There's this article in Quillette here. It says here, Centrism is a consistent philosophical system that attempts to guide political and cultural systems through change without paroxysms of revolution and violence. The centrist, in this sense, believes that political and cultural progress is best achieved by caution, temperance, and compromise, not extremism, radicalism, or violence. Well, okay, does that mean that they won't implement any laws? Every law is a restriction on your freedom backed up by the threat of prison. And yet it doesn't look like they're going to, because it says here, uh, they seem to imply at least to that we need a complicated law-based social order. 
But why? Why not a society based on norms, like cooperation and independence? The status quo is already really extreme, and the, the political economic system relies on huge amounts of violence to function the way it does. So if you were against those things, you would be against this violent system. A bit later, uh, it says um, some questionable things about so-called Western civilization, the achievements of Western civilization, free markets, equal treatment under the law, admiration for open inquiry, should inspire awe and reverence. You sure about that? Free markets have also come from a long history of violence. Equal treatment under the law? Do we even have that? I mean, sure, we have pieces of paper that say that everyone is supposed to be treated equally under the law, but every country has that. Admiration for open inquiry? What about all of the contributions of people outside Europe to our supposed admiration of free inquiry? Or, or all the people who aren't Western who appreciate free inquiry? There's a lot more like this, but as these lines show, centrism, as commonly defined, still rests on a number of questionable assumptions. This article says it's a consistent philosophy, but it doesn't seem to back that up. It seems like it's being pragmatic. One of the best articles I've seen on the subject is this next one, which uh, says that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren are the real centrists because they speak for most Americans. Um, it's one way of saying it. I think you might say it begs the question to define centrism as what a plurality of voters want, but uh, but but maybe that maybe that's what it is. Maybe maybe it's a, a good way of defining it. Actually, um, I, one thing I like about this article is that it shows that just because some politician or policy is labeled left wing doesn't necessarily mean it really is. I'll leave a link to this and all these articles in the description so you can see for yourself what it says. You could even read the Wikipedia article on radical centrism. But you'll probably find it not much different from everything else we've been reading. And if you think the term radical centrism is an oxymoron, you're right. Finally, we can have a look at this website here. This is the Centrist Party. Has, uh, it, it, what, what, how does it define it? Um, I mean... I don't know if it's a great way of understanding centrism through a political party. I mean, first, if you've decided to, to support a party, you've chosen a side. Wherever the party goes, you go. Or, less commonly, you abandon the party. Then it says here, first sentence, centrists don't have party lines. Well, what's this if not a party? Or is it a party with no policies? No, no, it's got policies. Let's go back to where we were. We can see them here. For example, uh, economy, secure, stable, sustainable. Those are, those are all words that I like. Well-reasoned economics. Who could disagree with that? Free markets through market transparency. I think... Uh, all political parties nowadays promote free markets, whatever that means in practice, as the, the road to prosperity. Market transparency sounds good, right? Sounds good. And market regulation. So don't worry. Sure, there's still going to be big business, but we're going to regulate the market like all the other political parties in the world. Fair competition, yeah, equality, 
of opportunity. I think we've we've heard all these things before. <clears throat> and actually, these sound like status quo, top right policies so far. It is this 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 website insists that centrists don't compromise, but it uses the same words and policies as are already considered acceptable by the public. The other policies here are the same. They, they read like other mainstream parties, except with more emphasis on, on different words. Words like well-reasoned economics. Let's go back to that. What is well-reasoned economics? Which school of economics are you using to decide that? Some centrists commit to not taking a side. Is not taking a side really possible? Some articles I've read on this subject say centrists support neither A nor B, implying that the sensible thing to do would be to find the middle point between those two. But there isn't always a middle point, or if there is, it's not necessarily reasonable. Let's think of some things and see where you stand. Let's take genocide. Now, it seems like an, a particularly serious subject, but it is an issue right now. The top right wants it. The left is working hard to prevent it. If people are truly centrists, they would believe, well, we should have a bit of genocide, shouldn't we? After all, if all those people think something, they're probably partly right, just like people who want to stop genocide are partly right too. So what, you're not going to take a side on this issue? Or are you libertarian and left-wing on the issue of genocide? Some centrists seem to be afraid of having an opinion, or else afraid of exposing it to the light and defending it. Or maybe they're just afraid of everything that seems quote-unquote extreme. On genocide, I take the extreme position of being unequivocally opposed. And actually, everybody I know personally agrees with me on that. It's good that we agree on that. But it's not a moderate position. It's an extreme position. Uncompromising. What about just killing some people because they're from a different ethnic group? How about just a few? How about just forcing them to leave their homes and move to another country? A lot of people in the top right are proposing that. How about just passing laws that discriminate against them? How about throwing people of different ethnic groups into jails at higher rates? How about policies that appear to be well-meaning, but have the effect of discriminating and throwing people in jail by ethnicity? Isn't that a compromise? If you're against all those things, you're ready to take a stand. And if you take a stand, you refuse to compromise with people who would do those things. And that would make you a principled anti-racist and anti-fascist. It's okay to call yourself that. It wouldn't necessarily make you a leftist or a libertarian, although at least one of those things. Think about other things people do that you disagree with. Is it something you should compromise on? Where would you put your perspective? Where would your perspective put you regarding that issue on the political compass? It's not necessarily out of ignorance that people don't take sides or have strong opinions. Not taking a side seems to be the norm in academia and the mainstream media. But of course, academics in the media do take a side. They just don't always realize or admit it. Refusing to take a side means tacitly approving of the huge amount of violence that goes on every day, whether the overt violence of police, soldiers, and non-state fascists, or the less visible but no less real violence of laws, evictions, jails, taxes, intellectual property, destroying the environment, destroying indigenous peoples, communities and cultures, sweatshops, deportations, state surveillance, and kicking homeless people out of their neighborhoods. 
Should centrists not have a position on any of these things? Or should they be trying to find the middle ground? Should we work through the system that does all this violence and try somehow to reduce it by compromising with the people who benefit from that violence? Is that realistic? That's all I'm hearing from these centrists. And yet, because the systemic violence is harder to see if you were brought up in this culture, because it's so normal we don't even think about it, a lot of people who wear centrism like a badge don't talk about it, but they are quick to speak up when leftists and anti-fascists use violence to actually fight back. We can disagree on the right way to change things. Of course, you don't necessarily need violence in the less there is the better. But you might need to defend yourselves and your communities and your universities and your labor strikes and your pride parades from police and neo-Nazis. How does a centrist know how to vote? If there are only two parties, there's no middle. So you vote for one of the two parties. If there are two parties and a bunch of smaller parties who stand no chance of getting elected, there's no reason to vote for them. So you vote for one of the two big parties. What if there's a third party, but it's to the right of the two dominant parties? Does that mean that the correct center way has shifted to the right? And you should vote for the party that used to be on the right but is now in the middle? Is it really in the middle anyway? Is anything? These questions may seem abstract, but they're actually quite relevant to voters because of something called the Overton Window. Noam Chomsky once pointed out the best way to keep people passive is to limit political discourse to a short range of acceptable opinions and call anyone outside those positions an extremist, a radical, and someone who just doesn't get how our country works. But when political discourse evolves, like the culture evolves, it tends to move in one or another direction. It might move towards an extreme. For decades, racism was considered unacceptable in public discourse in the U.S. But after years of white supremacists online evangelizing, public opinion has been pushed so far up and to the right that it has become more acceptable to be openly xenophobic and racist. In other words, the Overton window has shifted to the right. True centrists will also have shifted to the right because the center has moved. But why would they? Was it because they thought carefully about it? Or were they, were they just riding the imperceptible waves of culture like the rest of us? I haven't been moving up and to the right, like others, because my thinking is based on principles. While I am, of course, affected by the wider culture like everyone, I have spent a lot of time reading and thinking about why things are changing and where they should be going instead. Do centrists have principles too? If so, how can they be centrists? Trying to stay in the center would mean struggling to come to reasonable positions on political issues with no reference points except those already given to us in the culture. Even though the political culture is disproportionately shaped by the people in power. Does centrism mean believing things are okay the way they are? If not, does it, need, mean, does it mean we need to change? What kind of change? Change that couldn't be considered left, right, up, or down? Or are you forced to make a choice and thereby move away from the center? Do change and reform imply a move back to the center? If so, who decides where the center is in practice? How much health care should be free and to who? How good should education be? Should big corporations continue to have the powers they do? If not, how much should we take away? And how? I know we want the ideal policy, not necessarily a left or right one, but that's not really how policy works. 
policies inevitably help some people and hurt others. Which philosophy should we decide who benefits and who gets hurt? Whichever one we use, we're picking a side. If we have a supposedly left-wing policy, say some measure to reduce the gap between rich and poor, does that imply the next policy should widen it? Does it mean the next policy should continue to close that gap? If so, great, but that's leftist thinking. Should the next policy provide more power for businesses to accumulate money for no other reason than it offsets the effects of the original policy? Is the ideal policy somewhere in between the policies of the two main parties that dominate the political system? Why? The people in power are well aware of how millions of centrists think, so all they need to do is present their preferred policies as the result of compromise between two competing but equally legitimate sides of an argument. In the U.S., they call that bipartisanship. But then we still haven't addressed the problem itself. We've just gone along with what they want us to do. Is inequality a problem? Yes. If so, let's end it like the left wants. If it's not a problem, then why should we even address it at all? Which, by the way, is not a centrist but a right-wing position because inequality is already entrenched in this political economic system, and it's going to get worse with inaction. And I know there could be an answer in the middle, but what is it? Some inequality? Why? Why any? There are no benefits to it unless you're at the top. It's just the middle of the road that we happen to be on. Why do we have to hold on to this elusive balance when things are already so unbalanced? The point is not that the answer is never in the middle of two choices. It's that it begs the question to assume the middle is preferable. It's the classic logical fallacy known as argument to moderation or argument to middle ground. What gets called a middle way or a third way often ends up no closer to the ideal or to the truth. What would you do if there was a clear act of injustice, even though you couldn't do very much about it, such as if a state on the other side of the world massacres a thousand peaceful protesters? Would you sit on the sidelines? Would you only sit on the sidelines if the perpetrator was a centrist too, but speak up otherwise? Would you find ways to justify your refusal to pick a side by comforting yourself with available online articles that say things like the victims were throwing rocks or there are bad guys on both sides or something about extremism and terrorism? For sure, you can find that kind of article if you look for it. Or would you unequivocally side with the victims? Desmond Tutu once said, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. That's because powerful people don't need your approval to hurt people. They do it every day. But if you say no, if you protest, if you withdraw your consent, you're choosing a side. The side of justice. Just because there isn't much you can do right now does not mean you should pretend all sides in a conflict are equal. And if you're saying that's not what centrism is, think about which side you usually come down on. Is it on the side of the powerful? Or is it on the side of regular people? When you have principles and can do research, it's not hard to pick a side. I'm against imperialism, so I'm opposed to U.S. involvement in what's going on in Venezuela right now. But I'm against any kind of authoritarianism, so I support those Venezuelans who are fighting Maduro's government. I'm against U.S. involvement in Syria, but I'm also against Russian, Iranian, and for that matter, Syrian state violence there too. 
Standing on the sidelines means leaving the victims to the fates the powerful will decide for them. Yeah, there's not much I alone can do, I know, but when enough people of principle raise their voices in protest and maybe take to the streets, then things can begin to change. And if centrism finds means finding some middle way in these conflicts, what is it? What would it be in Syria? Maybe an arrangement where Bashar al-Assad's government controls, what, half of Syrian territory? And the rebels control half? Why? Or, or for the government to be forced to integrate a selection of rebels so the state is, like, more representative? What if just this government who used to have absolute power now has half power? What would any of these arrangements look like in practice? And how could they possibly succeed? The quote by Desmond Tutu shows that when it matters, there is no sitting on the fence. You can either support the oppressors or you can support the downtrodden. In my experience, so-called centrists frequently side with the oppressors. You might think you're sitting on the fence in the always correct middle of two always incorrect extremes. But there is no fence. You've already taken sides. You've lost your chance to do what's right by doing what's easy. Most people who call themselves centrists are looking for a center that isn't there. By questioning everything you know about the political system and political thought, you'll probably move in one or another direction on the political compass. And that's okay. Thanks for listening to this series on the political compass. My next video will be out next Saturday, so be sure to hit subscribe, comment with any of your disagreements, oh, and hit like on this video.